Good afternoon, this is Schweitzer. We're going to run through a second half of our Why is a Solid video a Solid? And this particular video is going to really just cruise through some of the internal factors affecting why a solid is a solid. Um, for this fact, it is, it's already gone through during um, the time frame of bonding. So let's take a quick look at some internal factors. Remember that internal factors simply um, all the content is learned in bonding. So we'll quickly review this content. However, we're going to spend a little more time trying to master our decision tree. And we want to make sure that if you, know, if you don't understand or have a great grasp on your, your learning, your decision tree for bonding and atomic structure, then you're probably not going you're just going to struggle this piece here. So make sure that you have that under your belt. Okay. Um, all right. So first things first, a new type of solid. So our solids might be um, ionic. You have an ionic solid. We have a, a molecular solid. And we have a thing called a network covalent. And this is probably the first time you heard of this. So a network covalent is a bulk crystal, so it forms a big chunk, big pile, just like an ionic compound does this, and actually metallic does it as well. It's a bulk crystal, but it's held together actually by, by covalent bonds. Very unique substance. Because this is our, probably our strongest bond, uh, it has extremely high melting points, like a diamond is 4,500 degrees. What is broken, um, what is broken requiring such high melting points? And the answer is a covalent bond. Every time we melt something, something is broken. So what's melted, what breaks from melted? A covalent bond. How do you know if a substance is never covalent. Okay. This question um, comes up to me quite a bit. And it's, it's one of those things where, a couple things. Uh, first of all, there aren't very many types of these things. Because okay? so I only like two or three, four different types. But if you don't want to memorize those, okay, we have a couple of them right here. SO2, diamond, graphite, silicon, carbide, that might be it. Um, how would we know though? One would be with a model like this one showing the connections with a covalent bond. And two would be some sort of obnoxiously high melting point. So some sort of data table and you see substance X and has a melting point like around 4,000 degrees. Then you're thinking to yourself, mm, likely could be a network covalent. Okay. All right. Properties of ionic solids. First of all, they're a bulk crystal, high melting points. They have unique properties of dissolving in water. What breaks when melted? An ionic bond breaks. One of the key things we do with ionic compounds is determine the factors affecting the melting points. Because we have one particle simply just attracted to another particle via Coulomb's attraction, uh, then we would use Coulomb's law to sort of govern how those melting points work. Size of charges is really important. First thing we look at, in fact. And the second thing we look at is the internuclear distance. Okay. As the internuclear distance goes up, the forces of traction go down. Molecular substances. Uh, well, the one they form a property. They form a molecule, a uniquely held item that can be sort of all by itself as a gas, or as comprised as a solid. What breaks when you melt a molecule? Molecular substance, solid. If molecules hold together, so what breaks? Weak intermolecular attractions like glue. Um, so we would break this 
glue right here, which we call intermolecular forces. General idea, as your intermolecular forces go up, your melting points go up. Here's a picture sort of highlighting all the different types. Um, and here's all the different ideas. Okay, there's a bunch of here, but just a general summary. Let's talk about these a little more. All right, so London is very forces. All the atoms have electrons. Electrons move by chance. More, elect more electrons on one side than on the other, causing a temporary dipole. These substances are not polar. They are not polar, in fact. These are not are just temporary poles. Sometimes I like to think of it as like a milk truck. And if you look at the milk truck from behind, it's circle. And it's got its wheel here, and it's got its wheel here. And the milk can slosh one way, or the milk could slosh back this way. But if you have yourself, let's say, a gravel truck, a gravel truck from behind, let's stay back 250 feet, right? Uh, it, it has this gravel in here, but the gravel, it, it could move, it does move some, but it doesn't, based on the property of gravel, doesn't really sway back and forth all that much, unlike milk does. This idea of electrons swaying back and forth is a term we sometimes call uh, polarizability. Polarizable. Water is more polarizable than gravel. It sloshes back and forth easily, of course temporarily. What are the factors that affect whether something is more polarizable? More electrons, long chains. So this atom, and you notice we have a dipole, temporary dipole, so we'd have more electrons on one side. We have three, you have six of these guys, so I'll do six. And then they can just literally drag these. If this thing temporarily forms, it automatically just pulls another guy temporarily. Okay. All right. Um, hydrogen bonding or dipole dipole. Of course, this is a situation where electrons are permanently dragged to one side versus the other. Permanently. What causes electrons to be dragged to one side or another? It would be a highly electronegative atom. In this case, um, the X could be one of these guys. Um, same thing here. So, but Y in this case is just some other atom, or in, in the case of hydrogen bonding, Y is a hydrogen. Keep in mind that this is not a hydrogen bond. I abbreviate that. Hydrogen bond. So, um, it creates a permanent dipole with permanent charges. The reason that this is super important is really for solubility. Things that permanently dissolve have permanent dipoles. Um, one thing I might mention here, just kind of uh, off, add on to this thing, pretty important idea here would be how do you go about demonstrating or showing a dipole-dipole moment and let's just quickly review that. Remember, if we have a water molecule, okay, that this thing forms with temporary dipoles, and therefore I'd want to show it something like this. And this right here is the hydrogen bond, right there, okay? So being able to draw that out is understand that's pretty important. Um, anything else? Okay. Um, let's walk through this. So, decision trees. Take a moment and jot out your own decision tree. How is this going to work? I got one that I put together right here. Um, so first of all, the type of solid. It's something new here. When a network covalent something uh, melts, it breaks a covalent bond. Ionic substance breaks an ionic bond breaks. And when melted, okay, um, bond, so we're looking at here things to consider to when affecting a melting point would be the number, the charge, and the inter 
nuclear distance. I'll abbreviate, abbreviate that for now. Um, molecular compounds, we look at these a little bit differently. Sometimes um, you can change how you want to do this. Make sure you do it how you understand it. What breaks here? What breaks would be a intermolecular forces. So we're trying to figure out what those are. The reason why it's important to know what they are is because increased intermolecular forces would cause an increased um, melting point to the point where something would either only be a solid or maybe only be a gas. So sometimes look at here, do you have a dipole moment? Yes or no? So um, there are a couple ways, really, this is refer referring to symmetry. Symmetry. Symmetrical. And let's say, for example, nitrogen bound to a nitrogen. There's no dipole moment. It's the same atom, very symmetrical. So if you have a dipole moment, the answer is no, then your nonpolar and only London dispersion forces are broken when melted. This factor would be number of electrons and long chains. Really, it's just your carbon, good old carbon atoms are the one thing that tends to string out. It's super common in RV lines. If you do have a dipole moment, it means you're not the same, you know, substance, let's say carbon monoxide, um, then you should note that, yes, I have a dipole moment. Do I have a, um, do I have a significant dipole moment? So symmetrical or not symmetrical, okay? So I have a dipole moment, okay? Do I have a significant dipole moment? So I have one of these guys. The answer is no, then I would want to go back to this guy. If the answer is yes, then I have hydrogen bond and or just a you know, dipole dipole so keep that in mind okay yours can look a little different but that's got to be understood and understood well all right so ch4 is a gas and c5h12 is a liquid okay so it's a molecular substance and there's another way to kind of look at this here so you could, i'm going to leave this one here and you can look at it first do we have an NOF? Do we have a highly electronic atom? The answer is no. So I'm nonpolar, and therefore London sort of forces with breaks. So you can, I mean, you can look at a couple different ways. Um, water, is, water is a liquid, but CO2 is a gas. So we are molecular. Do we have highly electronic atoms? Yes. Um, but the CO2 is symmetrical, and the water is um so symmetrical wise um no dipole created so i got this a little messed up here but we'll we'll fix it for the for a real thing here so this guy essentially is symmetrical so it cancels and goes down to london dispersion forces so it ends up down this way and the water is not uh symmetrical asymmetrical Dipole Korea, yep. so dipole, so we're not symmetrical. That's what this is. So we're not symmetrical, so we have a dipole created. And therefore, this where water is. We have one of these guys, so hydrogen bond is formed. You should be pausing these, trying your you out know, yourself to see what the difference is between these things. This one is a liquid because it only has di uh, London dispersion forces, whereas this one has hydrogen bonding, and that's what we're looking at. Okay, water is a gas, but but sodium chloride is a solid. Well, water, once we said, it goes down to hydrogen bonding, but ionic compounds go to ionic compounds, and there's much stronger bond. Uh, question four: Two thousand AcL is liquid, but aluminum chloride, aluminum oxide is not. So they're both ionic. They both break this, and the one difference here would be the size of charge. And a Cl is plus one minus one. Aluminum oxide is a is a plus three minus two. So larger charges means larger melting point. 
uh, at 3000, Al2O3 is a liquid, but clay silicon oxide is not. This one goes towards ionic compounds, but this guy is one of our unique guys that has an even higher melting point, and therefore the covalent bonds melted. This is a network covalent, where this guy is ionic. Very unique. Thank you very much. Mastering that topic is pretty important.